Hello again. So, science today is going to look a little different. Um, we are going to pick up where we left off last time. So, you need to be on page 264 on your science books. Um, this is going to look backwards, but for you, but it's going to kind of look, it's going to say when the wind blows. So, that's what your page is going to look like. So, you need to be on that page. Make sure that you have a highlighter ready as well and make sure that you are following along because like I said before, there are um, things we're going to highlight that are going to help you answer the questions in your Google form that you are going to have to, or your worksheet that you're gonna have to answer when the video is done. So make sure that you're following along. When the wind blows, a gentle wind can be pleasant, cooling you off when it's hot outside. However, a windstorm can cause damage. So what causes the wind to blow? That's what we're going to talk about today is what actually causes that wind to blow. The sun warms Earth's surface unevenly. So that makes sense because if it's winter here, it's not winter somewhere else. It's actually going to be summertime somewhere else. So it's heating the Earth unevenly. And this uneven heating causes differences in air pressure. So we talked about air pressure last time. Air moves away from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure, which is similar to how water flows downhill. This movement of air is called wind. Areas near Earth's poles, so like the North Pole and the South Pole, they receive less sunlight than areas near the tropics. So obviously when you think of the North Pole and the South Pole, you usually think of like, it's always snowy there, it's icy, things like that. But when you think of something tropical, a lot of times you think of a place like Hawaii or Mexico or Jamaica, somewhere where it's warm and sunny and beautiful weather. That's what they're talking about. And usually the tropics are located on the middle part of the earth as to where our poles are on the ends. Let me grab my globe and show you. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so we've got our North Pole and our South Pole. This is where it's usually cold when the, when the Earth is spinning. It's usually colder on our poles. But when they say the tropics, they're talking about these places that are in like right along this line, it's usually warmer there. That's where we find those like Hawaii and Mexico and Jamaica. They're closer to the center of the earth. <clears throat> At the tropics, so in the center of the earth where it's a lot warmer, warm air rises or the air is going to warm there. It's going to rise and it's going to move towards the poles. So it's going to warm from here and it's going to make its way either to the North Pole or to the South Pole. These winds are called global winds and they blow over large areas of the earth. They move large weather systems such as hurricanes. We don't get hurricanes here in Minnesota. We get other types of weather, but hurricanes usually happen to locations that are closest to oceans. Local differences in temperature can also cause winds. Earth's surface heats up at different rates. So for example, the side of a mountain heats up more quickly than the valley below. As a result, a valley wind forms as air moves from the valley up the side of the mountain. This is an example of a local wind. An anemometer, I'm in the green box now. An anemometer measures wind speed. You should probably highlight that sentence. So in your books, it's going to be in this green box. Highlight that sentence, the very first sentence. That's important. An anemometer measures wind speed. Wind pushes against the cups in the anemometer, causing it to spin. The rate at which the cups spin is measured and used to determine wind speed. A wind vane or a weather vane points in the direction from which the wind blows. 
So a lot of times when I think of a weather vane, I think of like, it's usually got like a cow or a rooster and it's usually on top of a, a barn. And when the wind is blowing, those little things are spinning around on it. But the way that the one is facing, that's going to tell you the direction the wind is moving. Up on the next page, 265. Local winds move short distances and can change direction. Daily changes in temperature can cause local winds to change direction. For example, at night, the mountainside cools quicker than the valley below. The wind at night blows from the mountainside to the valley floor. In coastal areas, so areas that are right along the ocean, they usually have beaches on the ocean. Daily temperature changes result in local winds known as land breezes and sea breezes. So now I'm in that green box on that page where it talks about sea breeze. During the day, land heats up more quickly than water. Air over the land also warms, causing the air pressure to drop. Cooler, higher pressure air flows over the water to the land, forming a sea breeze. So that's what that top picture is showing with the arrow going from the ocean water into the land. <laughs> land breeze. So at night, that land loses heat more quickly than water. As the air over the land cools, the air pressure rises. Cooler, higher pressure air flows from the land toward the sea, forming a land breeze. All right, turn the page. And now we're going to learn about how clouds form. So you are on page 266. Some clouds signal precipitation. Others signal fair weather. So how can you use clouds to predict what the weather is going to be doing? That's what we're going to learn. Air often has some water in it. So most of the time you can't see the water because it is an invisible gas called water vapor. We learned about that. Clouds form as water vapor cools and condenses. A cloud is made up of tiny water droplets and ice crystals. These are so small that air currents can hold them up. A water droplet can be thousands of times smaller than a raindrop. So remember we had talked about that before where we have all these water droplets in the air, but we might not be able to tell until a whole bunch of them get together and then that makes one raindrop. There are three main types of clouds. So we have a cumulus cloud. You should probably highlight this sentence. Cumulus clouds are white and puffy and are common on clear, sunny days. So those are usually clouds that we see in the summertime when it's uh, no weather. It's just kind of a cloud, um, like a sunny day with some clouds in it. Those are cumulus clouds. Under the right conditions, cumulus clouds can develop into massive thunderstorm clouds. Those are my favorite. I love thunderstorms. Now we have cirrus clouds, or cirrus clouds, which highlight that sentence. Cirrus clouds look like white streaks and are high and thin. Cirrus clouds usually signal cool, fair weather. Those are probably the clouds that we're going to see more like in the fall time when we know that the weather's changing from summer to winter. Highlight the next sentence. Stratus clouds are low and gray, making the day dark and gloomy. These clouds can produce or signal incoming rain or snow. These are the types of clouds that when, it's, when we're going to be getting weather, where they're just kind of like those dark gray type clouds, those are those. Those are stratus clouds. That's what they're talking about. So look at the box. You've got three orange arrows like squiggling going up. <clears throat> So number one, the orange arrows are showing how the sun is warming the Earth's surface, causing that air to rise into the atmosphere. So then you've got a purple number two with an arrow pointing up. Water vapor in the air cools and condenses around tiny specks of dust forming water droplets. And three, you've got a blue three with two arrows going out that way. These droplets join together forming a cloud. So on your next page, page 267, those are your three examples of the clouds that we just talked about. So the cirrus clouds, those thin, cold clouds that are made up of ice crystals. Fast, 
winds blow those clouds into lung streamers high up in the atmosphere. So those are those clouds that are like duper, 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 duper high up in the air. Um, and then that middle one are stratus clouds. That's kind of what I'm seeing right now outside the window. It might be different by the time you watch this video, but stratus clouds cover the sky with a sheet of gray. Thick, wet looking stratus clouds may produce steady light rain or snow. It was snowing a little bit this morning and it snowed yesterday when I made this video. So those are the types of clouds that I got to see outside my window as I'm making this video for you. Okay, and then that last one are the cumulus clouds. Those are the clouds that I think are the prettiest just because they kind of look like cotton balls up in the sky a little bit. Um, so cumulus clouds usually form early in the afternoon on hot, sunny days. If these clouds grow high and thick enough, they can develop into stormy cumulonimbus clouds. Right, turn the page and it's going to say some rain, anyone. You might not think about rain, unless there's too much or too little of it. But what causes precipitation? You should highlight this very first sentence. Precipitation forms when water particles inside of clouds grow too large and fall to Earth's surface. We've learned about this already, so this should just be kind of like a review for you. So the four different types of common precipitation that we see here in Minnesota for sure, rain, snow, freezing rain, sleet, and hail. So I know I said five. Before we hadn't talked about freezing rain before, but that's another pretty common one that we see here in Minnesota. Rain may start as ice crystals that melt as they fall to Earth's surface. That would be snow. Snow forms when water vapor changes directly into ice. Freezing rain occurs when falling, supercooled raindrops do not freeze in the air, but instead freeze when they strike objects near the ground. Sleet is made up of lumps of ice. It forms when rain falls through a layer of freezing air. The raindrops turn to ice before hitting the ground. Hail is made up of layers of ice. The layers form as air currents inside a thunderstorm cloud repeatedly lift and drop a hail particle. So each up and down trip adds ice to the particle. A ball of hail can be smaller than a pea or larger than a grapefruit. So hail. How that works is you've got this very, very, very tiny little ball of hail. It'll fall out of the cloud. So here's my cloud. It falls out of the cloud, but doesn't quite make it to the ground. So it goes back up into the cloud, gets more uh, moisture, water, whatever on it. And then it goes to fall, but it doesn't quite make it down again. So it gets stuck back up into the cloud. And it kind of just keeps going in that tiny little circle like that until it gets too heavy and actually falls to the ground. So you can have a hail ball that is like this big or this big. So it kind of depends on the number of times it goes through that little cycle up in the cloud. So those are examples. They give you pictures of rain, snow, and hail. Um, a lot of farmers usually have, or people who are in town, doesn't matter. Um, I usually see it on farms for sure. Farmers like to keep track of the amount of precipitation we get. So they've got a tool called a rain gauge, and that's what's pictured on the bottom of this page. So a rain gauge measures rainfall. Rain fills that gauge and the scale on the side shows how much rain fell. So if you look at that rain gauge, it looks like they've got about two inches of rain. That's quite a bit of rain. Page 269 is where I'm going to continue reading. Many factors affect the kinds of precipitation that falls in a place. For instance, snow falls in places with cold winters that would be us here in Minnesota. It also falls in places with very high elevations, like on the top of a mountain. In contrast, hail might fall anywhere at any time of the year. It may even fall in places near the tropics. People depend on precipitation to meet their water needs. Too much or too little precipitation can be a problem. So that top picture, too much precipitation can cause rivers to overflow. Floodwaters can damage crops and homes. We experience that sometimes in the springtime when all of our snow melts 
got to go somewhere. So it, sometimes it wrecks our farmer's fields. And then the bottom picture, too little precipitation is a drought. Droughts can cause the ground to dry out and plants and animals actually die when there's drought because they have nowhere to get their water source. What you need to do now is you are going to end this video and on your Google slide, you're actually going to complete that worksheet, which is also in your science book, but I want you to do it on Google slide so that you can hand it into me there and I can get that graded for you. You are allowed to use your science book on that worksheet. 